What's driving kind of the continued interest in probiotics is not only the successes that people have when they take them and the clinical evidence that's um, driving new applications, but also just the, the millions of dollars that are being funneled into trying to understand the role of bacteria in health and disease. There doesn't seem to be a day that goes by that there's not some type of announcement in the media of the importance of our gut flora to our health. Hi, this is Dr. Mercola helping you take control of your health, and today I am joined by Dr. Greg Lair, who is going to enlighten us about this topic, specifically when it comes to taking supplemental beneficial bacteria. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So why don't you give our viewers a, 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 a summary of your professional experience so they understand where you're coming from? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. So I got interested in microbiology and spent my graduate research career looking at pathogenic bacteria. So those bacteria we want to avoid and make us sick. Um, in the course of doing those studies, I became aware that not all bacteria are bad and became intrigued in this whole concept of probiotics. I was very fortunate then that my first postgraduate uh, job was in the area of developing probiotics for infant nutrition. And so that was 21 years ago, and I've been in the probiotic research and development field ever since then and has seen the research in the market just explode. Terrific. So, uh, and where are you working at now? So I work for a, a company, UAS Laboratories. We're a, a probiotic dedicated manufacturer. Um, we're passionate about probiotics, and it's all we do. Okay, so um, <clears throat> for those who are still unfamiliar with uh, the topic that we're going to discuss, maybe you can uh, identify some of or highlight some of the important concerns or issues as, as far as your from your perspective. Well, so the topic today is probiotics and. For your listeners, probiotics are those healthy bacteria that generally reside in our in our gut, which is where we have the largest concentration of our our commensal bacteria. The reality is that bacteria reside anywhere on our body that's exposed to the environment. So there'll be bacteria that reside in our mouth, on our skin, and as I mentioned earlier, the largest concentration will be in our gastrointestinal tract. And there's different bacteria that live in different locations in our gastrointestinal tract. And what's driving kind of the continued interest in probiotics is not only the successes that people have when they take them and the clinical evidence that's um, driving new applications, but also just the, the millions of dollars that are being funneled into trying to understand the role of bacteria in health and disease. So thank you for that. And uh, from my review and understanding and experience with this, this, the central component seems to be before we take a supplement to really uh, optimize the conditions where these beneficial bacteria can grow because one of the most likely one of the, the ways that eating a healthy diet is able to influence your health is through uh, modifying and optimizing the beneficial bacteria in your gut uh, and decreasing the pathogenic or disease causing bacteria, fungi, and, and uh, yeast. So uh, you know, the, that basically amounts to simple strategies like eating real food, which means avoids processed foods, and, and staying away from sugars because sugars will definitely fertilize and accelerate the growth of these pathogenic microbes. So maybe you can comment on the, the importance of that from your perspective. Yeah, it's very true. Um, you know, in studies that are done in people all over the world, you, you'll see different microbial communities residing in people that have different dietary intakes. And so you, you want to provide food that are going to nourish this healthy community of bacteria in your, in your gastrointestinal tract. And as you mentioned, sugars aren't selective. Bacteria like sugars, but the bad bacteria love sugars. And so eating real food, eating complex carbohydrates, fibers, things like that are more selective. And by that, I mean the pathogenic bacteria don't like them as much, it's more difficult for them to utilize them as an energy source. And so our good bacteria, the bacteria that we want to feed and nourish and keep at high levels, um, appreciate that kind of dietary regimen. So you can do a lot in maintaining your health, obviously, through nutrition. And that nutrition, as we understand things more and more, 
a, a large component to that is not only nourishing the human body, but nourishing this kind of um, large organ of bacteria that are residing within us. Now, uh, unfortunately, one of the challenges with the FDA and and telling something true about a product uh, that they prevent you from doing is the the topic that seems to be a hot button for them is what you do after after or while you're taking antibiotics because they're commonly prescribed and uh, most people watching this realize that even <clears throat> though they're prescribed to humans, 80% of the antibiotics are actually given to animals and wind up in our food supply if you're not careful on eating real food. So uh, the end result is you're exposed to these things. So I'm wondering, you know, the FDA, let me just finish the thought. The FDA doesn't allow anyone to market their probiotics saying this is useful to take after an antibiotic because it implies antibiotics might harm you in some way. So uh, maybe you can talk about that issue of the, the interaction between our gut microbes and antibiotics. Sure. A couple things there. One is um, we are restricted. We're, we're a regulated um, field, so we're restricted in what we can say about a finished you know, dietary supplement product. Um, that's, it, it has its purposes, right? You don't want to be false. And, and mm -hmm. not, sure. You, you don't want to it, be Ostensibly, we want to protect the public, or the, they want to protect the public. Absolutely. The, 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 the downside of that is that there's a lot of really exciting research that you're not able to, to talk about or you kind of have a muzzle when you talk about it. And one of them is the role of healthy bacteria when co-prescribed with an antibiotic and the effect that has on maintaining healthy populations in your gut. Because antibiotics are selective for bacteria, but they're not terribly selective for a particular bacterium. So antibiotics, and many studies have shown this, will have a tremendous disruption effect on the overall microbial community. They'll kill the target organism that might be causing your infection, and they've saved a lot of lives, right? But they also do a lot of harm to the good bacteria that are there. And studies have shown that when you co-administer probiotics with antibiotics and maybe continue that probiotic administration, you're more quickly able to restore that microbial community to the healthy state it was prior to the antibiotic treatment. And to your point about antibiotics in the food supply, you know, that's, it's leading to a lot of very interesting theories. And you, you might have read the book Missing Microbes. But there's this theory out there that this antibiotics, again, have saved a lot of lives over the course of history. But this overuse of antibiotics or this um, consumption of unknowingly consuming antibiotics through the food supply has a harmful disruption effect on the microbiota. And the theory is that this disruption is really kind of leading to a lot of these modern lifestyle kind of plagues, the type 2 diabetes, the obesity epidemic, immunological disorders that we're seeing in a, in a preponderant effect in the, in the westernized world where we're kind of being onslaughted with these uh, antibiotics unbeknownst to us in many cases. So the role of kind of keeping this intestinal microflora healthy, consuming active, healthy probiotic bacteria is a key component to maintain, in my opinion, uh, overall health. Sure. So uh, there's there's no question that the antibiotics have certainly helped individuals, but if one was to carefully analyze and objectively determine the, the, the true impact, I wouldn't be surprised if they've actually hurt more people than, they, than they've helped. In fact, I suspect that's the case. Okay. So for those who are taking them, though, it's been my understanding clinically that it's sort of useless to take a probiotic while you're taking the antibiotic because they non-discriminately kill them. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can comment on that. And then also the what, I, what I've recommended in the past is uh, giving a therapeutic yeast like Saccharomyces boulardii that uh, would not be affected by the antibiotic because it has a different mechanism and yet it would still support the microflora. Yeah, good question. So in terms of timing of taking a probiotic, in the clinical studies that I've been involved with uh, that have looked at the disruptive role of antibiotics and then the, the positive role of probiotics, we've just asked people to space out the consumption of them by a few hours. The antibiotics will be uptaken by the human body and absorbed, and then no longer really in the gastrointestinal tract in large part, whereas then if you hit it a couple hours later or a couple hours before with your probiotics, you know, you've got 
um, you've kind of separated the two, the two, um, you know. And that's, that, that seems to work from your analysis. It does seem to work. And then, you know, the idea of providing a yeast, the Saccharomyces, which is a yeast, a healthy yeast, there's a lot of studies on Saccharomyces and its role in preventing antibiotic associated diarrhea, right? So, the studies that I've seen, I'd say anywhere from 15 to 25% of people that are taking an antibiotic end up getting an antibiotic associated diarrhea event. And probiotics, which I'll include Saccharomyces in this group, um, have been shown to have tremendous benefits in reducing the risk of developing that kind of secondary complication of antibiotic treatment. Okay, great. So it basically just defining the optimal window, which is far away from the antibiotics that you're taking. Hopefully, if you're taking a once-a-day antibiotic, and there's a number of them that are available, mm -hmm. then that's easier. If you're taking two or three, it becomes more of a challenge, two or three times a day. So <clears throat> uh, I'm wondering, you know, one of the other issues that is not necessarily related to the, to the gut microbiome, although it might be, is the uh, leaky gut or a disruption of the in, in, uh, intestinal uh, connections, interconnections between the cells. So uh, that can be a very devastating problem. It's a real problem, and I've known a number of people who basically have just about died from that disease. And uh, typically, well, there's a variety of causes for it, but uh, it seems whatever the cause, one of the beneficial and perhaps one of the most uh, powerful remedies for it is bone broth to restore that gut lining. And I'm wondering if you're familiar of any uh, aware of any research uh, working with bone broth and uh, and uh, benefit probiotic uh, supplementation. So I'm not familiar with the evidence behind bone broth, but I am familiar with the evidence behind certain probiotics and their ability to kind of maintain that tight junction or prevent or lessen leaky gut. And the issue with leaky gut, as you're well aware, is you're getting things that are circulating between these intestinal cells and into the, the circulation system that aren't really supposed to be there. And much of it is LPS or a component of certain types of bacteria that cause this chronic inflammation. And there's... Yeah, and L... Excuse me for interrupting. Just to, for those who don't know, LPS is lipopolysaccharide. It actually is a clinical test, a blood test that you can have performed that will show you that you have leaky gut. Right. And so LPS is a common component of certain types of bacteria, not probiotic bacteria. Uh, these are gram-negative bacteria or different classification of bacteria. But you're right. It's a diagnostic tech to look for leaky gut. What we're finding out is that this kind of sub-chronic levels of LPS circulating in the blood causes this chronic inflammation cascade. And chronic inflammation seems to be at the root of a lot of uh, disease states that we're finding out today. One that is front and center is type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, and there's been some really intriguing work with probiotics, maintaining tight junction barrier, reducing leaky gut, reducing circulating LPS, and then affecting um, insulin sensitivity through kind of downplaying this inflammation that we're seeing. Okay, great. Maybe you can do over how, with the mechanism for probiotics, how they're working in some of the newest science that you're familiar with is to, that addresses these mechanisms. Yeah, the mechanisms of probiotics really depend on what probiotic you're talking about and what application you're trying to go after. I think probiotics have been tested, for example, in intestinal conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, which is a really tough nut to crack because there's not a really clearly defined mechanism that's lock solid. There are some theories, and it, a lot of these mechanisms will go back to the immune system and go back to inflammation. And I think that's one of the potential mechanisms of their benefits in irritable bowel syndrome. Um, you know, probiotics have been tested extensively for it, for their immunological functions. And by that, it means uh, maybe getting an elderly person's immune system back optim optimized function to kind of ward off pathogenic bacteria as well as increasing the immune cells that fight off cancer cells. Um, the mechanism of that is involving these orchestration of immune chemical messengers called cytokines. So there's, there's some areas in the probiotic science where the mechanisms are becoming better understood, and there's some areas in probiotic science that um, it's more theory than really causal right now. And a lot of research is going into understanding this. But you know, the more layers of the onion you peel back, the more you understand this is an incredibly complicated 
a web of information from gut to human to risk system to immune system and this complex interplay is not so simple to just uh, clearly uh, you know identify yeah i've seen uh, estimates that up to 80 percent of the immune response is actually a result of healthy gut flora so one of the best ways of course to prevent the flu is not to get a flu shot but to improve the health of your gut flora yeah very true you know and we've done i've done studies where we look we've looked at children um, and we just monitored health and well-being when they're on the probiotic and versus their, you know, counterparts in a in a school that weren't taking probiotics. And we monitored health and wellness, illness, incidence reduction of, of cold and flu-like symptoms. And it has a tremendous effect. And one of the secondary benefits of studies like that is you see a lot less antibiotics being prescribed. So the kids are healthier. They're not getting as sick. The doctor doesn't have a knee-jerk reflex of prescribing an antibiotic that isn't going to affect a virus anyways. Now, the ideally, uh, I believe that one should be able to may, uh, obtain most of their nutrients and uh, su nutritional support from the food that they're eating. And this is certainly the case with beneficial bacteria because you can get some, there's lots of good fermented foods where you can did, get that. So you wouldn't have to swallow a probiotic product necessarily. But one of my biggest pet peeves about some of these foods is uh, the yogurt, and we actually funded Cornucopia to produce a report on the the essentially the junk food <laughs> component of the, these yogurts, because most of them are nothing more than creamy junk food, and it's probably over 95% of them. So many people are seeking to improve their health, make, making these choices by consuming yogurts, commercial yogurts in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and thinking that they're doing themselves a good good job, but the reality is they're not. They'd be far out or off swallowing one of these pills and then decreasing their exposure to the, the usually the high concentrations of sugars and other additives in there that aren't even disclosed on the label. So maybe you can comment on on that. The fermented foods, sure. yogurt as a junk food, and then take versus taking a probiotic. Sure. So um, you know yogurts, if made properly and not overly sweetened, you know, is, is a decent nutritional food, right? Um, but there's a lot of yogurts out there, like you mentioned, if you look at the nutritional label, you're getting 25, 30 grams of sugar being consumed because they must feel that Americans like really sweet yogurt. The, the probiotic component of yogurt is typically even more lacking than the nutritional composition issues that you, know, you take umbrage with. On a probiotic perspective, the amount of probiotics that you're consuming in a cup of yogurt is, is logarithmically levels lower than what you get in a, in a quality made dietary supplement. And I've seen that. Okay. Now, size people would know what that would mean. <laughs> it's a good term, logarithmically. But, but let's, let's talk to the person who really hasn't taken uh, math or understands what logarithms are. So what we mean by that is if you're taking, uh, if you're taking a yogurt, you might be, let's say you're just use, you're getting a million probiotic cells, which sounds like a lot, but if you're taking a quality made dietary supplement, you're having tens of billions of quality probiotics being consumed. So you'd have to take 10, 20, 30, 40 cups of yogurt or more to equal what you'd get in one capsule of a quality made dietary supplement. So that, that's kind of a good way to look at it. I mean, if you're consuming of food. Well, well, millions versus billions. That that probably you'd need, I think, a thousand cups, maybe like oh. a truckload. <laughs> but I wanted to say you know, logarithmic analogy, but you're right. You're, you're a thousandfold difference in terms yeah. of millions versus. Billions. That's, th that's three orders of magnitude. It is. It's three orders of magnitude. So, and I've seen fun little advertisements where people advertise their dietary supplement as compared to a yogurt. You need, you know, truckloads of yogurt versus one. <laughs> so, which is the most cost-effective and easier solution? Right. Yeah, it's clearly the supplement, and and then you control what's there. You know, the other thing that you have to consider in a yogurt is it's a uh, in a yogurt you've got a very acidic condition that's degrading the quality of the probiotics over the course of the shelf life of that yogurt. In a quality-made dietary supplement, these probiotics are essentially in suspended animation or dormant until you consume them, and then they voila, you know, come back to life when you, um, when you swallow the capsule. So maybe you can address the issue of how frequently you need to take them with respect to 
uh, I, 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 the confusion that I think it exists in many people's minds that these bacteria implant. Uh, it's like planting seeds in your garden; they grow and reproduce, and uh, you know you basically need to seed and feed, and that's it. Right. But that doesn't appear to be the case. So maybe it, you can expand on that. Yeah, it does not appear to be the case with probiotics. You know, a couple things to remember is the intestinal tract has thousands of different bacterial types, not mentioning fungi and, and virus that might be there as well. It's a very complicated and uh, difficult to reside in ecosystem. It's a challenging environment. So probiotics have developed the ability to withstand normal concentrations of stomach acid and bile in the small intestine and live there. But they don't live there forever. It's uh, it, When you're trying to implant something into, into somebody taking a probiotic, when you stop taking the probiotic, studies will show that you start seeing less and less and less of that probiotic residing there. And it will kind of decline to this baseline level of before you started taking a probiotic supplement. So it's really important. And on the immune side, there's studies that show immune benefits decline within a few days after stopping taking the probiotic. And so it's really important that it's a continual onslaught of these healthy bacteria. And I'm sure you've educated people on this point. But it makes sense if you think about how our bodies have evolved to be. I mean, today, the way we eat... Um, is very different than the way our bodies have kind of been adapted. We're, our bodies expect to see these natural bacteria. You mentioned fermented foods earlier, the sauerkrauts, the kombuchas, the kimchi, an excellent source of naturally occurring lactic acid bacteria. And our bodies expect to see that. Our immune systems expect to see that. It develops tolerance by seeing these healthy bacteria. And so through supplementation, I think it's just really important to continue to provide you know, these high quality mixed culture probiotic supplements. So our immune system is happily sensing those. So uh, we're providing some compelling arguments here to, for people to consider uh, availing themselves to the benefits that we're describing and, and, and uh, taking a probiotic supplement. So in light of that consideration, I'm wondering if you could address some of the variables and factors that they may be looking at to identify a high-quality probiotic supplement, because there's a wide range of products on the market. It is, you know, and, and I actually have some sympathy for the consumer, because when you go into a store or you're shopping online, there's a lot of products that you can So how in the world do you make your choice? Um, so a couple of things that I could give out as recommendations is, one, a reputable brand. Um, it, you know, if you trust the products made by a company, perhaps they're doing a great job making their probiotic as well. But specifically with regards to probiotics, my recommendation would be look for a decent count, and that can be anything up and over, I'd say, 50 billion or higher. Would be and, that, and that count is typically CFUs, colony forming units, right? Exactly. So that's represented as a capital C F U, colony forming units, exactly as you, you mentioned. And it's also people talk about potency counts. It's all the same thing. It's the number of bacteria that are being delivered in that capsule. Um, the other thing you want to look for is a de declaration of a shelf life, which is essentially saying we're guaranteeing this count through the shelf life of this product. What you definitely want to avoid are those products that are still on the market that'll say we had 10 billion at time of manufacture. So that means essentially nothing to the consumer because they all could be dead when they leave the factory. So the companies that are doing it right are declaring a shelf life. They've got stability to prove it and they take great care in, in how they make that finished dietary supplement. So, look And this usually results, if they're going to make that claim, at some future date, then they typically uh, overcompensate. So if, if they're claiming 50 billion, they'll put in 75 billion, or maybe you can give more precise numbers. I'm not sure the, the overcompensation that's required. That's true. And the, the overcompensation or overage, as we call it in, the, in this field, um, is going to be different depending on what shelf life you want, what storage temperature are you recommending, what organisms are in there. And what else are you putting in with these probiotic organisms? You know, all these things, what capsule are you choosing, et cetera? What conditions did you use to make the finished product? All these things contribute to, um, and if you select them right, contribute to making a very high-quality probiotic product that will have appreciable shelf life stability out, you know, 12, 18, 24 months, depending on what you're looking for. 
And so there's a lot of science that's brought in that not only the science of the probiotic organism and what they do in the body, which we've spoken about, but there's a lot of science and technology applied to making the finished product so that the consumer is guaranteed to be, you know, consuming a high quality product. Okay, let's continue along the lines of helping the person make a good choice and identifying their probiotic supplement. So how maybe you can give some comments on what to look for in the type of organisms because that's that's clearly the next big component and there's a wide range of organisms out there and you know once you've addressed the stability and the, the competency of the manufacturer and and the guaranteed and the uh, the the quantity of the organisms. Sure. So I'm a big fan of multi-species. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, there's probably a, a point of limiting returns in terms of do you want 30 organisms or do you want, you know, 10 in a, in a probiotic product. But I think diversity is important. The studies where people are looking at human, you know, intestinal ecology would show that high diversity seems to be linked with health. Low diversity, you see low diversity. And by that, I mean um, you're not having the variety of microorganisms living in the gastrointestinal tract in certain disease states. And so we kind of want the opposite of that. We want to be providing a diversity of organisms. And the, the two easiest um, recommendations I can make is that look for products that contain species of lactobacillus and species of bifidobacterium. And the reason I say that is because lactobacillus species, so Examples would be Lactobacillus acidophilus, Lactobacillus plantarum, etc. These are types of organisms that predominantly reside in the small intestine or the upper GI. And it's important to note that that's also where a lot of these immune sensing cells are. So we, we reference the fact that between 60 and 80 percent of our immune cells reside along our gastrointestinal tract. Most of those are in the small intestine. So you for sure want to be taking lactobacillus so that it's sensing that. Bifidobacterium, on the other hand, reside in the large intestine or the lower bowel, and that's a critical location for human health as well. And bifidobacterium, I could go on and on about the benefits of them. Um, but they like it um, in the large intestine. And so what you want is a product that's going to kind of give you full-spectrum coverage of the lower GI. And that's why I would recommend species of lactobacillus and species of bifidobacterium. And within those, there's a, as you mentioned, there's a lot of different uh, subtypes or, or genus. Is it a genus? Species, okay. different species. Species, different species within the genus, like lactobacillus. So how, how many would you recommend within each one of the lactobacillus and the bifido? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough question really to quantify. Um, you know, I'd say... With the other thing you have to consider is um, these microorganisms that are sold as probiotics. Uh, you know, they're they're manufactured and non-GMO and using you know all the the great um, manufacturing practices that we provide to them today. But not all of the very unique organisms can be scaled up commercially and provided in a finished product. So we have a a limitation in bifidobacterium, especially where there's probably a handful of bifidobacterium species that are available, but bifidobacterium lactis, bifidobacterium longum, bifidobacterium bifidum, um, clearly are very important microorganisms. There's a lot of clinical trials done on these types of species of bifidobacterium. And as far as lactobacillus acidophilus, again, you know, it's the, it's the acidophilus, it's the rhamnosus, it's the plantarum, perhaps salivarius. Paracasei. These names might sound Greek, but um, they're just different. They're actually, or they're Latin. Aren't they? Or Latin. <laughs> <laughs> these are microorganisms that have a, a large body of, of evidence around you know, the benefits of consuming them. So one of the items that we skipped over was some more of the benefits of taking this type of supplement or making sure you're getting these beneficial bacteria in your diet. Uh, maybe you can dis discuss some of the gut-brain connection and, and how they interplay because there's more uh, connections from the gut to the brain than, the, than vice versa. And many people and experts uh, view the gut as our second brain. They so do. Yeah, I can expand on that a little bit. Um, it's a fascinating area of research and one that you know I follow closely. 
because it's not intuitive. If you look back in time, I don't think people really appreciated the role of a healthy intestinal microbiota or intestinal microbial community and how that affects health. So initially, if you look at probiotic studies, we're looking at probiotic benefits in the gut. So we're looking at um, intestinal transit benefits or constipation benefits or you know, pain, bloating, etc. But more and more, as we study the role of microbes in, in human health and disease, we're realizing that there's benefits that transcend the gut. So the immune system obviously transcends the gut. The immune system and our central nervous system have a complex interplay. And some of the more recent work is, is looking at this gut-brain axis. And a lot of the early work is done, obviously, in animal models, but some human work has been done looking at you know, the role of microbiota and anxiety and depression and moods. And there's an interesting study that just came out a month or two ago that kind of looked retrospectively at a study where people gave infants probiotic bacteria for the first two years of their life. And they were really looking at the ability of this probiotic to kind of ward off the incidence of atopic eczema or skin rashes. But they followed these kids as these kids aged. And when these kids were age 13 years old, they went back and they said, okay, let's look at autistic spectrum disorder and let's look at um, ADHD and things like this that'll be psycho kind of issues. And of the kids that took the probiotic, none of them had developed any kind of autistic spectrum disorders. And of the children that didn't have the probiotic, the control group, 17% of that group developed onset of autistic spectrum disorders. So the study wasn't designed to look at ADHD or autism, but it's an interesting way to look back in time and say, here's a, here's a population of people that were essentially imprinted with probiotic bacteria at a very young age, and we're understanding that there's this developmental window in young people that's critically important for probiotics. What effect does that have as we age? Um, and so that's another example of you know this gut-brain axis kind of deriving through the gut. It's bi-directional communication, but certainly probiotic bacteria have the ability to make compounds that interact directly with the brain. They influence the immune system, which has interactions and can cross the blood-brain barrier, et cetera. So it's a fantastic area, um, you know, and I'm sure you are, to keep tabs of because um, I, I think it's going to transcend, you know, medical practices. So... Maybe you can also comment on the your understanding as to why this is coming out now, not 20, 30, or 40, 50 years ago. And it's interesting that one of the first books on the topic indirectly, especially with relate to the gut, with re, relation to the gut brain axis, was by a book called Sugar Blues by William Dufty. It was written in 1975, 40 years ago, and he had pretty clear evidence that avoiding sugar would have dramatic improvement and influence on the treatment of depression. Didn't, from the, I read the book. It was a while ago, obviously, but I don't recall that he had a specific mechanism. But now it's very clear that it's, it's as a result of its influence on the gut micro, microbiome. But to, you could even take that to the next step, which he didn't, which is to consider supplementing with beneficial bacteria. Right. So it's interesting that he had there's, – there's hints of it, and he was a great example of it. But I'm wondering why we're seeing this in this – massive, uh, really, uh, amount of research being published and, and really the acceptance by even most conventional clinicians that this is a, an important influence on health. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, in other parts of the world, I think the acknowledgement that healthy bacteria have a role in health and disease is, is well established and probably accepted by the general consuming population as compared to in the U.S. I, I'm referring to a, parts of Asia and parts of Europe. It's traditionally practiced. There's history of naturally fermented food consumption, et cetera. So technologies and tools have developed over the last 40 years that have allowed us to take a closer look. You know, in 1970s was the dawn of molecular biology or the ability to look at genetic potential of microorganisms. And the tools have advanced tremendously since then genetic sequencing technologies. So all these tools are available for researchers now to get a much better handle on who's there. And the more we look, the more broader we're finding uh, organisms that we never even knew existed. And 
governmental research, NIH, other European and Asian governmental research funding groups are pouring millions of dollars into studying the microbiome, which is studying genetics, you know, and the genetic potential of the bacteria that are in our, our bodies. Associating the microbiome of the gut, the skin, the armpit, the scalp, to health and disease, and what role does that have? And so you have this constant funding of research. When I started in this industry, there was a human clinical trial published two to three a year. And it was primarily the big European yogurt manufacturers that were kind of some of the, the movers and shakers in the early days of the mid-1990s. Now there's a clinical publication, I think almost one a day. So instead of two a year, we're talking over 350 publications a year now on the effects of probiotic intervention. And so this is continually feeding you know, the interest in probiotic science. We have very basic researchers looking at microbiome, who's there, what role do they have. You have the application sciences that are allowing us to produce you know, terrific products and get it into the hands of consumers. And people feel the benefit. And so there's a market pull there's a research push, um, and together it's creating this probiotic, you know, community of researchers and consumers that has a very high trajectory in terms of growth rates. And I don't see it stopping anytime soon. I really feel we're just scratching the surface. And if you think in the future and you start talking personalized nutrition, um, you know, I think there's a lot of potential there for personalized nutrition and probiotic consumption because we're all a little bit different in who's in us and but we're a, we're a little bit away from commercializing anything there, but I think that's where it's sure. moving. So by implication, are you suggesting that uh, sequencing our own gen, gen, genome, which is now about $1,000 to do, uh, is going to lo be lowered to the point where it will be a, basically free? And by having that data and, and also analyzing our gut flora microbiome, that will be able to customize uh, formulations for us? I think the potential is there. You know, you can right now get your gut microbiome sequenced for $90 roughly. Um, now, what is the output of that test and how do you take the output of that test and convert it into changing dietary practices or supplementation practices? You know, I think we're, we're a little bit away from having it be directly causal, but we have to build the database. We have to understand who's there in health and disease and and see what the correlations are. But I think we're moving in that direction. Yeah, it's interesting. I know uh, Peter Diamandis and Craig Vander just started a, uh, a new company, Health Human Longevity, Inc., which is actually in the process of doing that, actually sequencing thousands and eventually millions of people's genomes and their microbiome and, and creating this database and then using machine intelligence to do a data analysis and, and basically develop some understanding of what's going on with all this information. Yeah, you can imagine how complicated it is, but it's going to take, you know, people like that that have, I mean, obviously Craig Ventner has been involved in all the, you know, the evolution of microbiology for many years, but it's a fantastic area to, to, to research. And I really do think it's going to change our, our medicinal practices moving forward. About a curiosity question. Um, the uh, bacteria in, in our and our system outnumber us 10 to 1. That's just the conventionally accepted numbers. But what I found really intriguing is that there's bacteriophages, these viruses that outnumber the bacteria 10 to 1. So they, there's literally a quadrillion of them, if you, if you do the math, yeah. in our gut. And I'm wondering if you have any comment on, on bacteriophages. And, or are they just modulated by optimizing the gut floor? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's an area that, you know, you talk about the explosion of probiotic research and the, and the gut bug research. I mean, the virus and the bacteriophage research will follow. Um, I'm, I know there's a lot of bacteriophage research as it's related to um, uh, food protection, you know, pathogen, kind of targeted pathogen killing. Um, but as it relates to human health, uh, that's the second wave, in my opinion. Um, and you're right. Okay, so this is coming in the future. I, I really, I believe it is. I don't know how we, it, how we interact with it, but I think we got to try to understand a little bit better. And that's not my personal area of expertise, but you're right. I mean, it's an area that's kind of underserved in terms of the research yeah. community right now. They're focusing more on uh, bacteria than they are on viruses, for sure. Yeah, I'm sure it's harder to do, also, and the numbers are just extraordinary. It is. It is. So, so do you have any other comments you'd like to share with us, or any? Uh... 
insights. On, on you know, I think um, the the only comment that I'll make is is comments that have kind of been weaved into the conversation, and that is that you know probiotic consumption for for health and wellness is here to stay, and there's a lot of compelling reasons for that. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of research showing on a daily basis. Um, the different areas that are affected by a microbial community. You know, the days of all bacteria are bad, are long gone. Um, some people's minds, they're still there, but they're slowly being transformed into, hey, wait a minute, you know, eating clean foods, eating natural foods, nourishing our gut and having a healthy intestinal community is really at the core of our wellness. Um, and so the more that message gets out and the more that we continue to research and publish those findings, the more this area, as a microbiologist, it's extremely rewarding because finally, you know, the invisible bacteria that live within us are, are getting their rightly place in terms of uh, the role that they have in health and wellness. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you for sharing this information. And just to highlight and emphasize, uh, we're both equally excited, most likely, about the what's going to happen in the future is it will help us to customize and refine our thoughts on this even more. But there's no reason we have to wait for the future because we know enough now to make a dramatic improvement in our health by applying what's already been found out, Clearly. that this gut is has a, just an enormous influence on our health and our immune system and our neurological system the way we feel. So it just, it's just beyond foolish from my perspective or irrational not to apply this information and benefit from it unless you have some death wish or you want to be sick the rest of your life. No, I agree. I agree. I agree 100%. There's no reason to wait. It's just going to get better. And we know that they have a lot of benefits today.